a lot of the old school IoT, I'm really going to connect this, let's call it moderately good sensor, maybe, or <laughs> slightly accurate sensor to the cloud. And maybe I can control it backward. Instead of trying to say, you know, the goal that we would have now is to create an intelligent environment. People have talked about a situation where they'd like that local control. You say, well, what happens if the internet goes down or some of these other things? I, I want to be able to continue to be able to operate in that environment independently. You know, that's when you start to be actually have an intelligent environment. You sit there and go, wow, I don't have all these failure cases. I have something where I can actually perform a task. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real-world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone, to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today, we're talking with Robert Parker. Robert has engineered some of today's biggest life-changing innovations, from Amazon Alexa to Fire TV and Prime Music. Robert has disrupted everyday consumer life with voice assistance and entertainment technology. After serving as a director of engineering at Amazon for five years, Robert became the CTO of SmartThings, leading the company's product and engineering teams while building the proprietary platform. From SmartThings, Robert teamed up with Alex to develop the newest transformative platform, Bright AI. As a co-founder, Robert develops the technology that makes industry disruption and extraordinary growth opportunities possible. Prior to creating groundbreaking technologies, Robert spent 18 years as a general manager at Microsoft. As an industry award and recognized technical leader, he holds more than 20 patents of his own. Thanks, Robert, for being on the Conversations on Applied AI podcast today. Great. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. It sounds like you've worked in large industries, small industries, uh, startups, sort of everything across the board. You know, I mean, I touched a little bit about the trajectory of your career. I guess, you know, maybe you wanted to fill in some of the dots with regards to sort of how you got into artificial intelligence and, and sort of work your way into this space. I've been in AI for a long time. Back when I was at Amazon, you know, we were starting to use it for some of the emerging use cases. And this time, it was fairly situational. So one of the things that just happened in 2008 is it was like the credit card decline. The overall market had gone lower. So you had a bunch of these businesses at Amazon that didn't know what to do. So one of them was they made credit card offers to people. And this was used to, you just have a $5 bounty in this, this kind of situation. This is an obvious case where actually it was an industry that was ready for something new because credit card companies did want just masses of people who were the same. They wanted particular cohorts and they weren't particularly actually interested in offering a bounty or even a good bounty because they really wanted sets of customers. This would go back to some of the things that worked before, which is they'd make offers to people with just when they graduated, know that they could have that customer for a long time. This is custom made for AI, both on that side of it, and this is one of the insights that I've carried through for today, to the other side too, which is the customers actually getting a pretty lousy offer. You're getting $5 to join a credit card, of course you're not going to change. But what if someone said to you, no, I'm going to pay for half your Prime membership? Or mm. what if someone said to you, I can give you 5% back because your spending habits really allow us to give you better offers and, and make some of that stuff. All those things have happened in the interim. So basically there are better offers and people have really great credit cards that they can do. But this was part of that initial use case. And we had a team who started to do some of these things. You know, that went into some of the more complicated things that you sort of mentioned later, like understanding someone's taste in music and whether they like a song or if you wanted to have a song that's classic rock and classic rock means different things to different people. These start to get to be much more interesting decision processes. And so one of the things that's been really great was the opportunity to, to start, you know, 12, 14 years ago in this and really grow with the space. Independent of that, one of the things that's always been exciting kind of in the AI space is really take it outside of recommendations we're just started. So basically, a lot of this was really used for recommendations or really basic sort of understanding. By the basic understanding, I mean some of the stuff in natural languages or uh, on the voice side. As you really got into these more interesting tasks, that's where you really got to feel and appreciate for some of the things that were changing rapidly in the technology and I think are really accelerating today. So doing credit card recommendations or or even listening to music and stuff is 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 interesting. How did you then get into IoT? Well, at the same time, so what had happened we're looking at things that Amazon really wanted, we started this hypothesis that 
want people to listen to more music. And you know, as you're interacting with a device like Alexa, music is certainly an important use case. However, one of the other things that's going on is everything else in that environment. One of the things that was great about the Alexa is a shared use device and it's in a space. And then as you start to think about spaces, then obviously IoT was really exciting. Part of that, one of the things that I was a little bit frustrated about at the time was really wanted to attach to a big device ecosystem that could really try to move things for people and have people participate. And that's why Smart Things was a really interesting thing for Alex and I to do is that we get the community involved. We really had this vision that an open, connected community could really bring this technology into people's lives and in really tangible ways. That was really exciting, but it, it missed a couple things, which is where, where I really ended up at Bright, which is actually consumers weren't the best place to adopt all of this. <laughs> and no, agree. We, we could go into, you know, a lot of reasons for that. But overall, you know, we really saw that there's this huge opportunity in enterprises. And really one of the things that we focus on at Bright, which shows even bigger opportunity, is these larger, more traditional companies which have fleets of people and machines. Because the real complexity starts to come in when you have real tasks. This goes back to what AI is, which is an ability to perform some of these complex tasks. Those usually will involve people and machines in various ways. And then there's obviously software that will be components of that as well. But as you look at a complex task that starts to span that, the things that are doing most of those are, you know, some of these things like large route-based businesses, or we have, you know, things like someone who's installing a pool. All of these companies are, you know, a huge part of the economy. And a lot of what they do feels a lot more like his large, complex physical workflows uh, and a lot less like something that you might have seen in consumer IoT. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I, I feel like in general, consumers are pretty fickle. They don't really spend a whole lot of money, right? People are like worried about, you know, spending 99 cents on an app, which is like ridiculous because they spent $6 on a latte. And in some ways, consumers don't see the capability, like the possibilities of what a smart home brings to them, right? So that was part of it. But the other part of it, which I think is e equally true, and I think we'll, we'll come into the solution, was actually the solutions didn't compete that well with what they had. So you have something which I like to call sub-millisecond, uh, you know, latency, super reliability. And then you compare it to, so, you know, at my home, I'll first share a, a slightly embarrassing story about what my wife said about the first prototype for Alexa when I brought it home. She said, Robert, why on earth would I want a talking trash can in our house? <laughs> now, luckily, growing up from that, we got to something that's, that's, that's more exciting. But overall, a lot of the connected solutions, there are a lot of trade-offs there. And so they weren't as resilient, weren't as responsive. And so that trade-off, I think, also impacts things. Because if you had something that's sort of unambiguously better, then all of a sudden, it, it makes it a lot easier. Now, the other problem that you have is, just like you said, the replacement cycles and the incentives are not well aligned as well. So if we instead compare it to a business or an enterprise, there are, we have a lot more levers that you can pull. You can create something that might do a revenue lift that might take you some time to realize you can do some things that affect costs, which might be immediate in terms of their trade-off. You can do a mixture of both of those. And that really allows you to make some of these better decisions. Because like you said, at the end, what's different is that from a technology perspective, we're finally having some of these solutions that can really do things that couldn't be done before. You know, I'll just sort of give a couple of examples of what, what I think yeah. is really exciting there is if you look at an old school motion detector, uh, old school motion detector really wasn't a very good signal as to whether something's going on in a space. And you would generally tend to want to reason a little bit better. Well, you might have had an open close sensor on the door, so you could sort of say, well, if there had been motion in this space or if the door had opened closed recently, I might want to do something. But what I really wanted to know is what whether there's motion and whether there's not. And as you found out, the places we live in are pretty complex. You have things like pets running through. Well, I want to ignore the pet. As we get better sensors, which actually have a signal where you could start to look at these things and recognize and exclude things like pets and understand people and understand particular people and identify those people, then you can start to build real intelligence into the space. And this is something which, you know, if we look on the industrial side, it's a lot easier, which is that you'll tend to have a sensor that has these higher degree of both fidelity and an ability to sort of recognize that, you know, those types of higher order events. And that's what brings value because otherwise, you know, any of these routines what was funny that what I would see in the old school IoT is that the routine was the opposite of intelligent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so it was frequently doing the wrong thing. <laughs> 
So, you know, my favorite ones were things like sitting in front of the TV and all the lights go out halfway through the great movie or at the dark spot and all of these types of things. But it comes down to the situational awareness was not really there. The signal was not good. And that really is one of the things that, that motivated us and in, in Bright to look at this. So we, why we think really strongly, and I'll talk more about the edge and the intelligent edge and that piece of it. But we say, hey, we have a set of better than human sensing. And we, we have a set of sensors that we ourselves make. We, of course, support sensors that other people make. But those things give you better. They're usually multimodal. So they have more than one way to determine whether something's happening. So it might look, for example, we have a camera that's IR and visual band. And so we might be tracking to by a heap signature, might be tracking to visually, might be doing both. Uh, but we have a way to, to bring these multiple signals together. And then usually the resolution is much better than a, a human being. And similarly, in terms of the measuring of the space, we have a set of LIDAR units. We can do, you know, millimeter or submillimeter measurements. And this gives you an ability to then say, hey, my intelligence doesn't have to be quite as acute because the, the information I'm giving it is the right information. It can very easily test these hypotheses. And at that point, then it can start to do the task better or at least as well as a human being. And that's sort of been the gap is a lot of these things would happen would be have you, you know, worse than human sensing combined with worse than human pattern recognition and you end up with a really poor result. Did you use the word old school IoT or? or Yes. Yes, I, I love that because I think that is, I, I think traditionally is what has happened with the Internet of Things. It's It's been out for, you know, I don't know when the term was coined, you know, way back in 1999 by Kevin Ashton, but, you know, really started glomming on and getting a lot of, you know, interest, maybe 2014, 2015 or so. And it felt like it was just a bunch of sensors being thrown together in a room and then kind of like, we'll figure out what's going to happen. And I think maybe what you're saying is, is, what happened wasn't so good. <laughs> the, the user experience, at least for the consumer space, really wasn't up to par with what people were going to be willing to pay for. You know, if you look at that sensors, people were really saying, you know, what's the most straightforward way for me to, to be able to get a signal there? You know, an example of sorts of some of the things that were slightly, you know, slightly deficient that you would often have is you might have a thermostat and you might have an external temperature sensor. I have no idea where that external temperature sensor is. I wouldn't really have right. a And so this is there and go, I don't really have a really good signal. Like if I went to back to physics class and really tried to do a measurement here, you know, everything that was entered in by IoT, the professor would immediately just have asked, said, you know, <laughs> you, you did not measure this well. It's not repeatable. It's not accurate. Also probably don't know when you did it. And, and so this is where if you, if we restart that process and say, okay, if I, I want a process where I would like to be able to reason against this. And so there, you know, sensing is this important part and I'm going to be taking more of a scientific method and more structured method there. I'm going to then apply from, to that perception, I'm going to try to apply some learning, some reasoning, some problem solving to this. Then you get to a really different place because that's, that's not really a lot of the old school IoT was like you said, I'm really going to connect this, let, let's call it moderately good sensor maybe, or <laughs> slightly accurate sensor to the cloud. And maybe I can control it backward. Best case, I have some control flow on the, on the other direction. Instead of trying to say, you know, the goal that we would have now is to create an intelligent environment. So you sit there and go, and, and like I've seen some of your other podcasts and people have talked about situation where they'd like that local control. You say, well, what happens if the internet goes down or some of these other things? I, I want to be able to continue to be able to operate in that environment independently and not require these things. You know, that's when you start to be actually have an intelligent environment. You sit there and go, wow, I don't have all these failure cases. I have something where I can actually perform a task. The simplest of those, just to take one example, is uh, to say, hey, you wanted to be able to enter and exit your house. You might have a lock as part of that. You sit there and go, I need that entry exit to work 100% of the time. It's not okay if the power goes out and I can't get into my house. That That's a big problem. So as we try to define these spaces, and it's especially true when you start to move this to a commercial or industrial space because the, the stakes go up. But with that, that's where I think it's really exciting because we now have the ability to have edge computing. We have a, a bright AI, AI hub, which tends to work as a local controller in these spaces. We have choices there for uh, our customers, but anywhere from a couple of teraflops up to 80 to 100 teraflops of processing capability for AI gives you a lot of opportunity to sort of say what and how you're going to do it. And I think that's really exciting. 
Yeah, for sure. So as we move out of the old school IoT into the new school IoT, you guys are focused a lot more, like you said, at at, uh, sort of compute at the edge or machine learning at the edge. Why do you think now is the best time for that? Are, are we seeing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm big into tiny ML, so we're seeing like these Im- embedded processors now that can run on very, very low power that are able to do that. Is the cost of the sensors coming down now? You know, we're- Well, not, not only the cost, but what you can do. So like, I'll give you examples of some of the sort of fairly interesting sensors we have because we somewhat model human, like I said before, but usually it's human plus. So I, I mentioned before we have, you know, combined visual IR camera that can also see UV. And when you can do that, you can really have a lot of sort of visual spectrum sensing. But we also have something, well, we have nanotube based something. We, we don't have a great name for this. So it's, we call it digital nose right now. But <laughs> what it's able to do is detect substances up to a couple parts per billion. So you've moved from that couple parts to million to couple parts per billion. At that point, you can really find different ways to test a lot of these hypotheses. And before it would have been, wow, I might be able to only detect one or two substances. Maybe I can have a carbon monoxide and that's it. And it, you know, at that point, you know, the hardware becomes really the limiting factor among others as you, you have such a rough environment. Then similarly, like you said, the other challenge is everything has to go to the cloud because that's previously, because that yes. was the only place that you could apply significant computing resources to things and, and really reason. Now you have amazing capabilities local. And so with that, combined with a lot of other things like better radios that that play into this, you have a fabric locally that really can be resilient, can be fault tolerant, has this great degree of precision. So what you can deliver is totally different from what was possible previously. And the second thing that plays into that space is kind of one of the things which was unsolved in what I call AI 1.0, and we're sort of moving to, I don't know, we're People are probably up to 4.0 now. But what was a a large challenge is that a lot of what AI was uh, applied to was these large, relatively heterogeneous problems. And so if you compare that to the types of companies that we work on and many others, you have a smaller set of companies. It's really AI for small data. Lots of other people are sort of thinking about this. But one of our clients, as an example, is, is CSC, which is one of the largest commercial laundry companies they do you know, at Disney, at Marriott, at most of your apartment buildings. They have about 200,000 locations across the U.S. Starbucks has 5,000 or 5,500 or something like that to give you a, a comparison. So a lot of locations in a lot of different places. At one of those locations, they might see 30 loads of laundry uh, a month. At a big location, they might see a couple hundred. If you were training something on a recognizer to try to, you know, determine certain things about that, wow, you're just not going to get, you know, it can get the millions of loads of laundry. <laughs> This is very typical is that we often see this. And what's really nice then when you have that amount of computed power there is you can start to actually have algorithms that can be custom tailored to these smaller data sets and manage them appropriately in a cost efficient way. For example, a conducive local training can train itself up. It knows how to recognize in that, that space. And so then all of a sudden this becomes possible and feasible where it wasn't before. The second problem was the other half of that, which is normally before, if you were going to transfer all this data up to the cloud, I mean, that's real money. The thing that's interesting in AI is you're better off the more data you have. <laughs> the more data you have, of course, this can cause a lot of costs, unless you can process it locally. So it allows you to sort of double optimize. You you can optimize for that variability and be locally optimized. Plus, all, you know, you're greatly reducing the amount of data that has to move from X to Y. So with those trends, Then you start to say, wow, I can apply this to way more problems instead of, you know, relatively small set of problems that are, as I said, generally a little more heterogeneous. Yeah, I love the concept of distributing the compute, I guess, out to all these all these little things. It just makes a lot more sense than sending all the data in centrally and having, yes, you could have, uh, you know, GPUs running in the cloud and all that sort of stuff, but you're going to quickly get overwhelmed, especially, you know, in the in this particular case, maybe there's not a lot of data, but if slash when there does become a lot of data, it feels to me very inefficient to have to keep sending that data to the cloud. One of the things that's true as AI is really evolving, signals like visual are becoming big. So a lot of what we do with, with visual-based systems, you're just at a huge amount of data there. Even if you're just 1080p times a couple of cameras, you just automatically at the point. So we do local recognition. We do local recognition 15 frames per second on site. We're finding people, machines, vibration, this kind of stuff. And the alternative is just staggering, even at you know the first level. Then, like you said, the part that's amazing, though, is that I can go to that next level of 
recognition. So one of the things that we do, we started with sort of recognizing people and which machine they're interacting with, and we can understand whether they're loading and unloading the machine. We actually understand whether they're staking out the machine by throwing a stock in one <laughs> and nice. we encourage them to do something else. But this is the part that's amazing is that if you're doing it locally, then it's really easy to pop on those other recognizers. I'll give you an example. One of the most fascinating things we found uh, with this was that a hypothesis was that the reason that machines were getting unplugged in these environments was because people would be plugging in their cell phone. That was sort of the, the going hypothesis by the business teams, which makes sense. It turns out not actually the case. Uh, so part that was interesting was, now the most common case was the cleaning staff would go in and unplug the machines so they could plug in the vacuum cleaner or whatever that they oh were doing. Oh my gosh. Then the yeah, second sure. most, most common case that happened was that people actually figured out they didn't like what's going on with the machine. They were rebooting it. Oh, okay. Anyway, Oh, customers are really doing that. Uh, so this is where you get these, you can get these kind of insights. So we had a tamper detector, which basically started to go off. And with that, you were able to really start to understand the space. If you had that going up to the cloud, it would really take you a long time to get those type of insights because, you know, you're, you're just looking at it too large a set of data across too many triggers and it just, the complexity goes way up. I love that. I love that story like that because, yeah, so many, the, the thing that I talk to companies a lot about in this space is, is you have no idea how customers are using your products. Just just generally across the board, right? You, they, you might have a survey, uh, you might have a hypothesis like you're talking about, but until you sensorize the thing, you, you, you really don't know. This is probably the best thing that we saw because this is applied across every single one of our customers is like this. Latham Pools, which is like this, one of our customers is one of the biggest pool uh, installers the U.S. had a great business because of COVID so that they've been installing more and more pools. And during that time, they also had a whole set of hypotheses. And most of what, you know, their field staff thought, most of what their installers thought, largely incorrect. And and it's just because like anything else, they just know what they run into. And then these things just, they're sure of them. But part that's amazing about this is you went and talked to the field operations. They're like, we've been doing this for a long time. We know. And then what's amazing is when you give them the insights back from the system, they don't even question it because really? what it does is it actually makes sense. Because the reason was the tricky part is, and this is, this is again where I would differentiate sort of AI IoT from what we're calling old school IoT. Old school IoT will tell you what happened if you're lucky. But let's assume for the moment <laughs> you were lucky and it told you what happened. It doesn't tell you why. So you have no insight. You can't actually diagnose, you generally cannot diagnose or fix the problem. But with these more complex signals, you're able to understand both the what and the why. You're able to diagnose the issues. So when I can provide some of that data back to you, it was very much like the sample use case. I would say, it's not just I'm telling you there was this tampering because then I would have been just like them. But I could tell you, oh, these are the types of tampering and give you the Pareto. Then they're like, oh, that totally makes sense. I now totally understand why I perceived that it was just the unplugged cell phone case because that was the only thing that was left in there. I did the, the one thing I could count was that. Oh, I got yeah. that one case, but there were actually four other tampers that I missed. Then you can really understand it in that way. And so this is where it gives you that next level of insight where you're saying, oh, I understand some of the causality and the correlation between that. And, and I can really get to that insight level. Yeah. Well, so you, you brought up a term, AIoT, which is yeah, for people that that are listening maybe haven't heard of that, but it's the artificial intelligence of things, right? It's sort of this this next way of of how Internet of Things and AI are sort of overlapping. Could you speak a little bit to, to, to that? And I think the other aspect too that maybe we touched on, maybe we haven't touched on yet, but is really what's the value from a security standpoint, from a security model of having yeah. smarter things at the edge, not having to send data back? So actually, I'm going to answer your second question first because it actually fills into this. You know, one sure. of the things that we look at is as you were getting these better sensing going on, better, what we call better than human sensing at the edge, actually, you really care about the privacy and security of that data then. So an example is people always care about visual data much more than they cared about some of the other sensor data that was coming back. They're sensitive about this. One of the things that's great is you make the edge more sensitive. What we have, for example, is our cameras recognize your head and blur out your face and those features in hardware, in firmware on the camera. And so this is pretty good because this guards the privacy of the individuals. And we gen- generally try to recognize you as something that looks a little bit more like a Minecraft thing than a human <laughs> sure. being. Anyway. But 
you know, that helps you a little bit. But then you say, what about, and this is what happened to us almost immediately as we started to have, you know, thefts and some other instances that we had to manage. Luckily, we had put it in a technology where we sat there and said, oh yeah, well, we have that key stash so we can actually undo that privacy filter, but you can have that chain of trust where we have a situation where, oh, if we give this to law enforcement, they can undo this. And then you can put in the right safeguards and you can decide, you know, who and how you're going to manage these things. But this is something where, you know, at that point, what we have is something where we've got hardware trust established directly all the way from the device out to that data. At the same time, you still have that breadth of use cases. So we could say, oh, I didn't have to have a separate security camera. I can really manage the whole system. But you need that in order to be able to handle the complexity of being in the environment where you'd say, hey, security and privacy are really important considerations. We take that very seriously on you know, the customers and customers of, of, of the system. We want to protect them as well as we can. And then at the same time, we also want to be able to manage some of these situations that everyone jointly cares about. Because like, for example, in the case that I said, the security case, the end customers cared about theft as much as other pieces of theft, as much as anything else, because it might have been their, you know, objects inside that room, which were impacted. And so this is something where you say, wow, that really requires the edge to up level a little bit. You can't have these not as intelligent pieces there because you really want to up level what's going on. The second thing that is really key in sort of AI, IoT is to say, a lot of the IoT framework started with just that connection problem. There's sort of data from X to Y. If you started instead from the premise that you wanted to inject intelligence into the space, then you would do IoT very differently. And so this is a lot of the premise is that really the IoT piece of our system is the thing that gives the eyes and the hands to the AI. And it allows us to do some of the things that, you know, the what I would then say I can then say old school AI systems struggled with. They just are a consumer of some data. They can't try, learn, fix. They can't test different hypotheses. Went back to some of the problems that I described earlier on from my where we're sort of trying to decide what music you like. This is interesting to us to give you a song that you don't like and make sure you don't like it. Some of that negative testing hypothesis as it is for the, the positive testing hypothesis. But if I can't reach in there and get you to try something, then, you know, this becomes very hard. But in this newer model with AI IoT is there to say, if I'm giving the AI hands, it can actually try that. We, I, in these operations of these machines, we test both positive and negative hypotheses. We find different ways to measure things. And in that, we create you know, this virtuous cycle where you're really able to interact with it, much like you know, the places where AI has been super successful, like doing something like playing chess or Go. I mean, they, don't, they wouldn't do that if you did. All you said is you could study previous games you could never play. I can't, can't let you play a game of chess. All right. That's a real problem. So in this, what AI IoT lets it do is it allows the computers to then start playing the, the, the game of chess and, and really interact in those environments in a meaningful way, which means that it, it is actually able to do the thing that you wanted to do to be AI. And AI, if it's doing AI, it's supposed to be able to perform a task. Yeah. That's of some level of complexity. Usually human-like complexity is, is the way that we think about it. And so this really is the missing piece to that. Yeah, I like to tell people, and you, yeah, you've you've hit the nail on the head a number of times here. That in my mind, IoT is sort of reactive technology. It gets a bunch of information, and it feels like you actually have to react to something. Whereas you're in this, if you're in this AI IoT space, it allows you to be more predictive. You talked about the what and the why. It, it, you're right. You're sort of framing the problem up from a completely different angle, not just like, hey, let me throw some sensors and get some data, and then let's react to what we find. It's like, no, we're actually going to try and have a better outcome here to begin with from the get-go. And how can we do that? I guess you touched on it a little bit. It's it, it's not only, I guess the technology is getting to a better point here now, sort of 10 years into the Internet of Things, which feels like it's taken forever for it to finally start getting traction, I guess. It feels like every year, IoT, yeah, it's the next year. It's going to be taken off next year. But in a lot of ways, it's even going away. I, I feel like it's more, it's its really more us approaching it from a different angle. I think one of the other challenges has been the integrated execution. So the hypothesis early on was that it's actually valuable to have 100 people produce a temperature sensor or whatever. But the reality yeah. is actually, and when you look at this, this is true across almost any of the IoT sensors and even across this different standards bodies. I mean, you don't know, there's no difference between any one of the Zigbee ones that you could get or any one of the Z-Wave ones or a- any other flavor that you might have or fairly limited differentiation. What mattered was, does it actually work in the workflow that I <laughs> wanted it to work in? The challenge is that 
as you move to, you know, the newer stage, you sit there and go, actually, it is fairly feasible for me who might own that workflow to pick sensors which are appropriate to integrate them into your environment, whether that's a commercial environment or a home environment, I'll stick with the commercial industrial environments, integrate those into those commercial industrial environments in a way that's, you know, 100% reliable, proper for that environment. And so once you do that and do it that way, I said, actually, I didn't need all these other choices. What I needed is I didn't want that work that had the right sort of cost profile. And so what's really changing in my view is that there's a real opportunity now. Now it's relatively easy for you to work with the module providers to be able to get a device that meets those specifications that then can be connected to the rest of the system instead of one where it'd be like, oh, I'm the device manufacturer to make my economics work. I need to have my own cloud and probably my own app. And by the way, you can't get access to my data. And you know, it's about as useful to people's home as a Nest thermostat without being mean about this. But they'll sit there and say, I must control all my data, even though it'd be really useful for you to know what temperature I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to reach in your house. But I'm not going to tell you that because I'm smarter than you. This is kind of the the wrong direction that a lot of this went. Instead of saying, no, I'm going to try to provide you with the most insight possible in a way that can really be leveraged by the other components of the system. And really, in order to do that, you need this slightly inside out approach. But what you did need was, you know, it wasn't like it was beneficial to people to have a thousand different makers of light bulbs. And, you know, this is where, you know, I think the industry just jumped too far to that and actually was looking more at, if we're going to talk about real old school, the analog world that was that had happened before it and say, well, you know, this really was beneficial because as people were building houses or revamping spaces, it's really important to have something that could fit into any space and there are different trade-offs. And so I want to be able to just pick the exact right trade-off. That kind of thing doesn't work very well and actually wouldn't be the way larger scale or corporations, organizations work anyway. If you look, they always have some standardization because they sit there and say, yeah, that integrated execution is the, is the high level, most important factor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you were mentioning about cloud. I mean, what's what's your guys' stance at, at Bright AI, you know, on that? You know, you mentioned you guys will have sensors and stuff. Maybe you could share, I don't know if you can share a little bit about, you know, what you have coming out. And I think everyone think that the cloud is an important integration and point for you and adds value. And when it's there, it can add certain values. So I'll give you examples. Like, for example, when you want to transact against the system, the cloud has to be involved, minus some offline transactions. But when they finally get processed as a transaction, there's a cloud involved. <laughs> and so there'll be these integration points where you know you need it. And similarly, when we have cloud to cloud integrations with other companies. So cloud is important. And you know we have use cases that are part of this. But really, you look at this as augmenting that environment. We started that environment and work outwards. And we see enormous value, but it would be the same way where I'll say, we also see enormous value in our applications. So we have a generalized installer app because, hey, the only way we can get into those machines and, you know, into the hands of the field staff who need it, going to have to have something that we can do. And in all of those things, what you're really trying to say is, I want to make those workflows work really well. So when we look at, say, for example, installation, so a lot of, one of the first things that typically happened for us was that we tend to monitor other machines sort of a typical workflow for a bright one is so we have a set so if it was an hvac heating air conditioning machine for example as just one example we'll have one of our boards which monitors the temperature and the pressure and a whole bunch of other stuff and some of the ways that it monitors it is not invasive and some of it is invasive because it's whatever the best way so we just sort of plug in so that will require some installation of course because we want to look up a couple of these things and what we try to do is make sure that that's as simple and trivial as possible including some of the things that in IoT are known to be not so simple and trivial, like joining them. And, you know, our perspective is we believe in single path. We believe in doing these, you know, using some of the new technologies that have come along that really make this possible so that you make it as easy as possible and robust as possible for a person to do it. And, you know, before, I think a lot of people looked at most of those flows from the perspective of there were a variety of people, a variety of stakeholders who had different conflicting goals. Uh, one of the stakeholders you're always going to talk is the security and privacy people. And they're like, oh, you're going to have to make sure there's a QR code or might be some other code here and you're going to double check. And I remember one of the buildings that we had installed at Samsung, we were doing motion detectors. This is in the main campus in Korea. I think there were 13,000 washrooms that had to be done or something like this. And you had to go scan the QR code and enter the number for every one of those 13,000. 
And it was all because, you know, there's a security person saying, that's really important because I wouldn't want someone sneaking in and like grabbing your washroom. (laughs) You know, in in there, if you really looked at it from the environment perspective, you say, I could come up with a way that would ensure that I'd have physical access. Yes, I can make it trustable, but I also could make it scalable so I could do 13,000 leads if I was going to do it much easier than, than one. And so this is where, you know, we really focus as a, as a company is sit there and go, there'll be some mobile. If you, if you could touch all of those pieces, a little bit of mobile, a little bit of cloud, a little bit on the device side, you can then create that intelligence, which would do this. And then, you know, AI can even help you out because AI can be some of the anomaly and other stuff where it could say, Hey, wait a second. I've seen someone trying to install three washrooms. I wasn't expecting. Maybe there's some reaction that I should take much like. People have done that for proximity and to getting homes. If they knew that you were on the way home, then I don't need to challenge you at the front door. Another time when it's a little bit less unexpected, I might give you a challenge and a second a second factor. So when you work together and you have enough of these pieces, you can really start to make that complex adaptive system and make these things simple, which is really important because, you know, as an AI company, one of the other things that we're doing, and I think most AI companies are like this, we don't tend to eliminate jobs. What we intend to do instead is say, wow, you can support twice as many customers or three times as many workloads with the same number of staff that you had today. Or I make that person able to do way more or more importantly right now, because this is one of the things we see in almost all of our customers. They have some people who are very well trained and usually it takes them three to five years to get minimum level of training in, in that job. And then they have people who are retiring out of the positions now in their workforce, it might have 20 years. We we'll say, if I can make it something you could learn to do and do effectively in six months, that's way better for you. And it's actually way better for the people. They don't have to spend five years attaining that, that same level of skill. And so in this, you know, a lot of what we're doing helps doing that because every one of those weird edge cases that you took out was that tribal knowledge that they had to then figure out that added up to those five years. And so the simplicity then says, oh yeah, I have a system where they can be experts in a relatively short amount of time, and it's relatively robust. And so that's going to require a lot of these ingredients coming together. And that's where I think that, you know, AI IT really shines because you then can take that business problem, which is, hey, I want to be able to manage my workforce differently. I want yeah. the cost of becoming an expert to go way down. I want the transferability of those skills to go way up. This is the other thing that I sort of tell a lot of our customers now is you have that person who has that 20 years of experience with this I can actually sort of immortalize a set of that, much like, you know, Richard Feynman, that was course notes, and now physics students are better everywhere for that. This is that sort of thing where you can do that again and again across all these use cases. Yeah, it's fascinating. So yeah, that was one of the things that I do like to talk to people about, you know, like, what is the future of work as these new technologies are being adapted? And it sounds like, yeah, you guys come kind of on the side of, it's a complementary skill set. It's a complementary tool that humans will be using uh, in the future, it's not out to eliminate anything. And quite frankly, the only thing it's going to eliminate in some cases, hopefully most cases, I guess, is all the busy work that you don't want to do anyways. So I think, like you said, it's augmentative. I mean, this has been sort of the way it's been going really since the Industrial Revolution is that at the end of the day, instead of looking at it the other way around, which is like what's happening to the population, you look at a single job and you say, wow, I, if I can make a single person way more productive, then oh, yeah, they can do more things and more... and you know, that takes you down this very positive road, which generally is the way the technology has gone. It's sort of like, if you imagine years and years and years ago, you probably didn't move within, this would have been my great grandfather's generation, wouldn't have moved within 10 miles of, you know, where they were and say, wow, today you can be anywhere. That doesn't mean you have to go anywhere, but it means that things can. And so this totally changes sort of the equations and the elasticity of it. And I'm sort of, you know, the thing that's going to be really interesting about AI that's going to be different from the previous ones is the speed of change. And so really you're seeing industries where it's applicable and what will happen is for each industry it will become applicable, more applicable at a certain point it tips over very, very quickly. But what you're seeing is that those things transition in a couple of years, not a couple of decades. And that's, you know, a huge change from pretty much every other technology transition that we've seen. And so because of that, the challenge for all of us, and I think that it's something we want to think about is, yeah, people's lives and jobs will change. And we need to be more thoughtful. We need to be pretty thoughtful about that. It's something you can plan for and think about in this, in this transition. It is positive, 
but it is a change and, you know, change needs to be managed. Yeah, for sure. Well said. Well said, for sure. How do people reach out and connect with you, Robert? You know, obviously they can go to bright.ai and I'll put all sorts of liner notes and, and information here for this podcast. One great way is uh, just emailing me at robert at bright.ai. One of the best ways to get in touch with me. And I really enjoy talking to all sorts of people who are trying new things in this area, because that's the thing that I think is also really amazing is you're starting to see people. So one of the things that we're doing one of our smaller projects, a little bit scientifically focused is we're applying AI to astrophysics, in particular, uh, a lot of the imaging that's happening in that space. And so you have stuff that is really cool happening, both from really a set of amateur type people who might have telescopes in their backyard and you know, do some limited sort of astrophotography up, up to this hyper professionals at NASA and everything in between. What's really nice is in all these spaces, there are these like sub communities. And, and so it's really cool to get dragged into. In that case, what was really interesting is that a lot of the more sophisticated algorithms that we've applied for, say, for example, tracking of objects or identification of objects hadn't really been applied in that domain. So they've been really looking at picture correction and things like, you know, I just want to see this picture much more sharply and let me eliminate this bright star or <laughs> let me uh, <laughs> adjust for the fuzziness of the atmosphere and stuff like this and, and say, as soon as you opened up some of that through a connection, then people were like, wow, there's all this cool stuff I can start doing. And the part that's really amazing in all this is that millions, actually hundreds of millions of lines of uh, open source are available for people. So you can start doing projects in this space at a very low barrier to entry. So this is where it becomes really, really cool for you know, newer practitioners. Well, speaking of newer practitioners, I guess people that are just getting into this field, I mean, how, how do you... Obviously, there's lots of hardware. They can just start buying and just playing around with it. Is that the best way? Uh, the great news is there's a whole bunch of different resources. I'm a fan of some of the courses that MIT and Stanford have, and those are ones at the beginning level. You have things like Coursera that allow you to be more structured around this. YouTube's always never about a kind of kind of me are never bad places to start to sort of like just get some of the little bit popularized stuff. And then from there, you start to say what might strike your interest and then get into a project. So I think getting hands on is is really cool. My daughter had this really interesting idea that I've encouraged her to go off of. So she's interested in mock trial and hence was interested in sort of all things legal or some things legal and really was saying, hey, it'd be really cool to start to apply this to law because she said, you know, there's a lot of things that you could understand from sort of a propositional calculus perspective. And really, it's it's a lot like sort of the computer-centric proofs where you sit there and go, there were a lot of people who found it a little less satisfying when you did the four-color proof this way because they couldn't fully understand, you know, verifying it was was somewhat difficult. And they felt like you didn't necessarily get as much insight as you might have gotten the other way, but it was sort of this really useful tool. But then actually can take you further than that because as you had the right tools and visualizations, you actually could solve all that problem. So then go, actually, this is even better because... I can see all the constituent pieces. I can see exactly how this breaks down. And then, you know, I can, I can test and verify as I want. And I might actually have more insight than actually I went into a lawyer's office and just say, I have to trust you that you'll say that this is, this is roughly accurate. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they think this, for example, a contract between two companies, the understanding was in common and also met the appropriate laws and, and those things. And this is where I think that it's really exciting because you can take these domains that, you know, are as out there as that apply some of the stuff and the stuff mostly exists to do a couple of steps in almost any domain, even something like that. In fact, I know, so in this case, she started to look into this and found that there were a number of people who were doing small projects in, in this area. And it's just a great time to be able to start to engage. And maybe it is in a lot of these cases, it's just getting access to the data, you know, right. finding enough of the right kind of data in order to train these. The thing that's really cool these days is this is part of how there's been a lot of push in the last 10 years to make a bunch of these data sources available, both from sort of a legal and regulatory standpoint, where they sort of have open information acts that allow you some access to this information and the fact that they're finally getting sort of some level online. But with the combination of those things, What's been really cool is that people are often able to get access to information sources that would have been very difficult in the past. And, and so it's, it's really there. The barrier to entry is fairly low. And, and with that, you can really get started. Yeah, very cool. I am teaching a class this fall. I've, I've taught at the University of St. Thomas here in St. Paul, Minnesota for a number of years on IoT, but I'm changing the course up this year. Um, 
really focused on IoT, but it's like AI IoT. Basically, I'm going to have the students not only generate data, get data from the physical world. And that's kind of where the first course ended. It was like, you know, get the data, make sure you can get something from a physical sensor, you know, put it, take it from the physical to the digital, show me that you've done that. And then we kind of ended there with this capstone project. And really what I'm going to encourage them to do is that's just, you know, step A. Step B is now going to be actually training a machine learning model and then running it back down to the microcontroller, having it actually behave offline. So allowing them to now generate their own data sets, right? I think it's, it's, it's going to be a, a lot of fun. So we'll be sort of exploring into that space. When it comes to career opportunities, I guess, you know, as we get sort of near the end of this, though, yeah, it looks like you guys are, are hiring like crazy. I like to use this platform to let people know, I guess, in particular, <laughs> if you guys are growing. Absolutely. Look at careers that write that AI and we really want all sorts of multidisciplinary people. So one of the things that's great because we as a company serve enterprises and we're sort of full service on this, there's a lot of different ways that people are contributing. So we definitely need the standard technical domains that people would expect, but we also need people who can cross those. In the end, one of the ways that we measure ourselves is the value created from that. So it's either the business value or some of those intangible people values that we sort of talked about. But we really look at, you know, how much better did that task get? And, sure. and so with that, there are a lot of ways to contribute. And as a result, we've found, you know, some of the things that are, are really true. And this is where we partnered up with some universities that are like this. So CMU has the same sort of multidisciplinary philosophy that we do. And say, you know, some of the people who are best suited to really attack this is people who can look at a couple of those and bring together a couple of those disciplines. So with that, I'd sort of say, hey, you know, don't worry if, your whole career wasn't in AI. Don't worry if your whole career wasn't in firmware engineering at the lowest level at one of these things, because a lot of that is become a little bit more commoditized. And now we start to that it's more the application. So we're an applied AI company and similarly applied IoT, just like you're saying in your course. I mean, you're taking people and you're making them flyers. And that's really what's exciting. That's great. Well, you, yeah, you couldn't have summed up our podcast any better by saying you guys are an applied AI company. I mean, that's, that's really, this is what I love doing is just talking to companies that are actually applying artificial intelligence across multiple domains. So appreciate uh, your time being here today, Robert. Was there any other topics or, or any other things that you'd like to share? I mean, I think we covered a lot here, but I always want to see if people look, maybe miss something along the way. I think we had a great introduction to sort of the AI IoT domain. The one thing I would end up with is to say that this is something that we're passionate about, and I'm sure I know that you're passionate about it as well, is that having people understand this emerging field. So there's, a, you know, if we want to say something that really bridges the physical domain with AI in a tangible way, this is something that's really going to start happening. And I think it's the evolution of both AI and IoT. But I think that it's really great that people could call attention to this because I think that it's much more tangible than either of its sort of feeder technologies, either IoT or, or AI by itself really doesn't have that level of impact. So the more that we get people to appreciate this difference, sort of like moving from a DOS text-based ass to a GUI-based ass. So you sort of say, hey, I want to drive attention to people can do some GUIs. And in the same way, I sort of sit there and say, I want to draw attention, you know, think of how much powerful your user interface can be when we sort of move it to the graphical level. Same thing is think about how much more powerful your IoT can be when, when, you know, intelligence is infused in it. Similarly, think about it as, think about how much more powerful your AI is when it can touch and feel things. And, and so that I think is, is really exciting and really want to thank you for helping get people be more aware of this and build that momentum. Absolutely. Cool, man. Yeah. You couldn't, couldn't have summed it up any better. If could have summed up any better. So yeah, Robert, I appreciate the time today. Look forward to uh, all the great things ahead for Bright AI and for sure put links and everything like that, like that off to you guys and, and see how uh, we, we can help you guys and how you can help, I guess, as you already are doing, uh, help companies deploy this new technology and make our lives better, make the world a better place through your, your new technology. So thank you. Thank you, Justin. You've listened to another episode of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at AppliedAI.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at AppliedAI.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. 
Thank you for listening. 